So welcome to today's MRS webinar. My name is Uwe Schröder from NumLab in Dresden. And today I'd like to talk about uh, ferrolytic hafen oxide, how to make hafen oxide ferrolytic, and as applications, the ferrolytic random access memory and ferrolytic field effect transistor. This is a collaborative work between a lot of different international partners. And one comment on NumLab. NumLab is a research organization owned by the Technical University of Dresden. If you would have asked me 10 years ago if hafen oxide is ferrolytic or not, I would have told you, well, it's a centrosymmetric uh, material. So either in the undoped case, you have the monoclinic phase of the hafen oxide, or in the doped case, you would have the tetramer cubic phase of the material. They're both completely centrosymmetric and there shouldn't be any ferrolytic properties of the material. But then if we, at that time when we looked for a hafen oxide for DRAM applications, uh, we found at this phase boundary between the monoclinic and the tetramcubic phase of hafen oxide for thin, so typically in the order of 10 to 50 nanometer thick hafen oxide layers, um, the ferrolytic properties of the material and which uh, later was confirmed as the orthorhombic PBC21 phase uh, of hafnium oxide. So a little bit closer look into the structure. If you're looking here at the hafnium oxide, you see these four uh, oxygen atoms within the hafen oxide lattice and, and these would be like the lighter and the darker red ones are the two different polarization orientations of the material uh, for the two polarization states. And uh, so if you think you would put the material now in a capacitor structure, you apply a, a field from, from here to here and you could basically switch the four uh, oxygen atoms within the position. Um, you would always get, if you switch the material, um, a switching current, and that's what's plotted here. So if you basically, over time, change the field on the capacitor structure at some certain fields, you would see switching in one or the other uh, polarization direction. And if you integrate this uh, switching current, you would get the polarization. And that's what you can see here. It's a the typical polarization hysteresis of the material and the main important parameter we later on will look into is the remnant polarization. This is this value. This is basically the polarization that's left when you have no field applied to your capacitor structure. And with this I'd like to come to the outline of my talk. So first I will go uh, and show you applications of the ferrolytic caffeine oxide before I go into uh, the properties of the material and later on the root courses for the ferrolyticity in caffeine oxide. So in the first five years uh, when the material properties were found in doped caffeine oxide, industry was mainly interested in non-volatile memory devices and here mainly into uh, one transistor, one capacitor FRAM cell versus a one transistor based uh, FIFET cell. And uh, the FRAM cell is very similar to the DRAM case. And here we have a select transistor and the ferrolytic FM oxide into as the dielectric of the capacitor. And depending on the polarization state of the hafen oxide, you could store the information. And on the other hand, uh, the one transistor cell, here you replace the gate dielectric by the ferrolytic hafen oxide. And with this could uh, have two different turn on voltages of your um, gate transistor. And you can see this over here, global foundries replaced in a 28 nanometer high performance transistor, um, the hafen oxide based gate electric by the ferrolytic hafen oxide. And you can see here nicely the shift in the turn on the threshold voltage of the transistor uh, for the two different polarization states. And the difference would be here in the order of one volt. 
Um, so for the FRAM case, it would be very important that you could uh, build also scale devices for future uh, FRAM memory cells. And uh, Fraunhofer IPMS showed that uh, going from the planar to a three-dimensional structure, you can get the according increase in the remnant polarization value. And this is uh, one important uh, topic if you want to go to scaled uh, FRAM capacitors. And here's the clear advantage compared to the currently used lead zirconium titanate FRAM devices. Currently, the devices you get um, on the market are planar devices, but if you want to go to three dimensional devices, you can see if you're PZT, you're uh, let's say conium titanate is in the order of 70 nanometers. It's very difficult to scale these devices to smaller ground rules. On the other hand, um, like a current DRAM structure would be an 18 nanometer um, structure. So here one capacitor would be two of these white lines. Um, and you can imagine that uh, like a seven nanometer hafnium oxide uh, has a clear advantage compared to a much thicker PZT layer to be introduced into these uh, very um, scaled devices. Then in the last five years, a lot of other devices uh, came up and uh, people looked into. Uh, so one is uh, ferrolytic tunnel junction, then negative capacitance fats, anti rams, neuromorphic, and other tunable devices and paralytic devices. Okay, coming to the second topic would be ferrolytic properties of doped hafnium oxide. Well, in our case, we use atomic layer deposition to deposit doped hafnium oxide layers, but on the other hand, there are also other deposition methods possible, which is like sputter deposition, um, sol gel, pulse laser deposition as some examples. And um, for the ALD case, the um, ALD process, the atomic layer deposition process consists of a two-step process. Basically, you deposit your metal precursor. In this case, we typically use Tima hafium as the um, hafium metal precursor. You purge all your precursor, then oxidize uh, the precursor to form the hafium oxide, purge out the oxidant, and then start um, this uh, cycling again. And to include some dopants in the layer, you typically do some supercycling. Supercycling means you would replace your hafium precursor by a different dopant metal precursor. Uh, other possibilities, of course, to improve the process would be to change the oxygen source. Uh, in our case, we used also ozone or oxygen plasma as different sources. And with this, you can change the oxygen, oxygen content in the layer and have also some, um, with this, some impact on oxygen vacancies within the layer. Uh, the position temperature is another knob. Um, for lower deposition temperatures, you would typically have a higher carbon in the mount in the layer um, or nitrogen, and this can impact um, the grain size of the polycrystalline hafnium oxide later on. Um, another factor to impact grain size is, of course, the film thickness. Both impact surface inter interface energy, and this impacts also the ferrolytic properties of the hafnium oxide. And the last factor in the ALD process would be strain or stress. This could be either coming from the crystallization process of the hafnium oxide itself, or by, for example, different electrode thicknesses, or you can also change uh, the stress within the layer by introducing a plasma uh, step in the deposition process. Um, also, this is how like the capacitor structures after and you look like. You can see nicely the tinitride electrodes and the hafium oxide layer in between. And typically, the hafium oxide 
grains are in the order of the physical film thickness of the material. And uh, the other important thing is if you think of a polycrystal material and depending on the orientation of the grains, you would have also a different orientation of your polar axis within these grains and this can have also then an impact on the uniformity of your ferric behavior within this layer. That's just to keep in mind uh, for the devices we're looking into later on. Okay, so now after we looked into the basic uh, properties of hafnium oxide, let's go into the root causes of ferroelectricity and let's start with doping. Um, so the first example would be silicon doped hafnium oxide. Here's as x axis the silicon content. And uh, we start first with the Raman polarization value of the material. And uh, you can see for a very low silicon doping in hafnium oxide, you would have uh, the monoclinic phase as seen on the, on the right side. And we see uh, basically no polarization hysteresis of the material. If we increase the silicon content, we would go through the uh, orthorhombic phase of the material and you'll see uh, this nice hysteresis curve of the material at the same time when uh, there's the highest of amount of the orthorhombic phase in the material and also uh, increase in the dielectric constant. Further increasing the silicon content we go um, to the tetral phase now and so from the ferroelectric properties it looks like a pinched hysteresis which is like a anti-ferroelectric material, so field-induced ferroelectricity in the material. And uh, typically um, the tetral phase increases drastically for this high uh, silicon content in the material. And then going to further higher uh, silicon content, uh, the ferroelectric properties disappear. So we looked into uh, different uh, dopant materials ranging from silicon, aluminum as dopants which are smaller than hafnium oxide to yttrium, gadolinium, lanthanum, strontium which are from the atomic radius larger than the hafnium oxide. And uh, the main thing if you look here again dopant concentration versus the crystal radius that uh, for the dopant smaller than hafnium oxide we see only a small range with ferroelectric properties so the blue dots are where we see the ferroelectric properties and the small range of this anti ferroelectric properties before the properties disappear versus for uh, the larger dopants that we have a much wider range we see the, the ferroelectric properties and again these properties coincide with the certain phase of the material. Okay, second point is auction vacancies. Auction vacancies, well, uh, from uh, the characterization point of view, it's difficult to determine the amount of auction vacancies in hafnium oxide. So we have only two indications that auction vacancies are favorable for the formation of the ferroelectric hafnium oxide phase. First is from simulation point of view, you can see here um, that for high amount of oxygen vacancies, you see if you look here at uh, the total energy difference of the system compared to the monoclinic phase, uh, the tetracubic and the orthorhombic phase becoming more favorable compared to the nonpolar monoclinic phase. And uh, looking into experimental results uh, from our colleagues at Intermolecular in uh, California, um, if you have a higher ozone dose in the ALD processing, which means a lower oxygen vacancy concentration in the film, you reduce the Raman polarization value, which means also the monoclinic phase becomes more favorable again. But this is just an indication. Further experiments have to be done. Okay, with this uh, coming now to the next point, stress in the layer. Uh, so if we measure stress in our hafnium oxide layers, uh, we measure values in the order of 1 to 2 gigapascal. Uh, there was uh, some additional work 
from uh, University of Dallas um, and Professor Kim's group. And they reported if we have our capacitor stack and increase the thickness of the top tie nitride electrode here from 45 to 180 nanometer tie nitride, that on one hand we increase the tensile stress by, they measured this by uh, the difference in curvature of the film. And uh, with the increase of the internal stress, also the Raman polarization increases. So it seems like stress is also an important factor to uh, improve the Faraday properties of the layer. So last topic would be surface energy. And as mentioned, surface energy is directly related to the, to the grain radius of our polycrystalline films. And, um, and you can see here, typically for very thin hafnium oxide films, we have a low Raman polarization value and with increasing thickness we first go through a maximum before um, the Raman polarization properties drop again. And so this is kind of similar for, for different dopant materials. Definitely one thing we see for all of these is that if you increase the thickness that also the monoclinic phase portion within this hafnium oxide layer increases and in which is the main cause for the reduction in Raman polarization value, and which is also directly related to uh, the grain size uh, of the material. And with this, I'd like to come to the summary of my talk. I hope I could show you the knobs of fabrication of ferroelectric hafnium oxide together with the root courses uh, for the ferroelectric phase and a list of ferroelectric, piezo, and pyroelectric devices for future applications. And I'd like to thank for your attention. I'd like to thank our funding partners for their financial support. And I'd like to thank the NumLab team and all our collaboration partners for the very nice uh, collaborative work to figure out the ferrology properties in hafnium oxide. Thank you very much.